Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Bryce Duskett and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Since the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is on shutdown for the holiday break, we'll be taking a look back on some of our most popular stories over the past couple of years. Kicking things off today, no matter what type of crops you have, many producers are always looking for ways to rid their fields of weeds without utilizing chemicals. One way to accomplish that feat is to crank up the heat. Market Journal producer Brad Mills gives us our first look at a process called flaming and shares whether or not it could work for your particular operation. No matter what type of field you have, battling weeds can cost you time and money and really try your patience. Over the years, different products have been introduced to the market, but oftentimes the weeds will win out. According to Dr. Stephen Knezovic, a weed scientist with the University of Nebraska Department of Agronomy and Horticulture, six weed species have developed a resistance to Roundup, a common herbicide. We've been using Roundup Ready technology for the last 20 years or so. And then over the years of uh, overuse of Roundup and over relying on Roundup, you know, we're seeing uh, weeds just uh, resisting uh, Roundup. Uh, one of some of the latest cases are uh, uh, glyphosate resistant, the Palmer, Palmer pigweeds or Palmer amaranth. Now many farmers are turning to flame weeding or flaming. It's a method that in the past has been used primarily in organic agriculture. Some of the issues that we have now with the Dicamba technology, with this potential drift and everything, some of the farmers uh, chose to actually go back and plant conventional beans, and some of them are actually interested in using flaming for weed control. Knezvik helped patent a four-row unit that he uses in his research, but notes that farmers can use a flaming kit the size of a backpack or look into a massive eight and 12-row machines. Flaming uses a propane-fueled torch and can reach a temperature of up to 2,500 degrees. It will cost about 10 to $12 for an acre for one shot of flaming. Flaming is done at least uh, twice in the season. You can start off early uh, by planting the crop, let the crop come up, let the weeds come up, and then you can do some rotary homing, you can do some cultivation, or you can do the first shot of, uh, of flaming. And with all this technology, it's important to understand your crops and how the flaming process works. Improper use could result in a severe loss of yields. Depending on which crop you have, some crops are, tr are trickier than other. You know, if you flame, for example, beans, uh, you can kill the beans or you can hurt the beans pretty bad if you don't know what you're doing. Corn is uh, corn, all three corn types and sorghum, these are grassy type crops that are pretty resilient to flaming. Uh, you can nip the leaves uh, with the uh, with the flame, uh, but the grow from the growing point, the new uh, new plant is just going to keep uh, keep going. In soybeans, if you nip the growing point of soybeans, then you're in trouble. So basically, and then you can come back later on when the plants have some height and everything and do a second shot, second shot of flaming. Currently the technology's biggest drawback is a lack of equipment for flaming to be the only source for weed control, but researchers see the method as having a strong potential. What's the future? Uh, this year I had 67 organic guys. Uh, the, the wetter we have the spring times, which means you cannot go in with a mechanical means to remove the weeds, this might be your one of the only alternatives. So, uh, so basically that's the answer, what is the potential for that? It all depends what, what, are, the, uh, what are the environmental conditions out there. You know, but this definitely has a potential to be one of the tools in the toolbox. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Brad Mills. Thanks to Brad for that contribution. If you'd like more information on weed flaming, we've posted an informational link to the Market Journal website about this particular method. Moving on, and earlier this fall, the University of Nebraska's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources held their fall Hearman lecture titled Mythbusting, Cattle and Climate. This lecture took an in-depth look at how the cattle industry is currently impacting greenhouse gas emissions and shared ways to effectively neutralize them. We were fortunate enough to get some one-on-one -on -one time with the event's keynote speaker, Dr. Frank Mitloner of UC Davis, to learn more about the presentation. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has this story. 
When it comes to climate change, there are a number of contributing factors as far as greenhouse gas emissions are concerned. When we take a hard look at emission totals, it's apparent that the cattle industry does have some influence on these numbers. However, the Cattle and Climate Lecture strives to make some critical examinations of those totals and shed some light on some common misconceptions when dealing with reducing emissions tied to the cattle industry. Well, one misconception is that there are some people who say, ah, climate change is not happening. Well, guess what? It is happening. Another one is, yeah, livestock has nothing to do with it. That's a misconception. Livestock has something to do with it. We know how much, but we also know that these issues of producing greenhouse gases do not only pose an issue with respect to a liability, but they can actually, if treated well, be turned into an asset. So I do a lot of research on quantifying greenhouse gases, gases such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, these are all referred to as greenhouse gases. So I do research in quantifying those for beef, for dairy and other livestock species. And most importantly, we do a lot of research in reducing, how to reduce those gases. Because if you reduce them, you have an immediate impact on climate. And that's uh, the majority of what we do research-wise. CO2 or nitrous oxide. One of the big points of the lecture dealt with the flawed nature by which methane emissions have been quantified over the last few decades. Dr. Mitloner discusses newer quantification guidelines and the discrepancy between the two methods. Yeah, one of the biggest takeaways is that the way that one of the greenhouse gases, which is methane, the way that this gas has been quantified over the last 30 years was significantly flawed, significantly flawed, overblown by a factor of three to four. A recent IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, report uh, confirmed that, that if you use some of the antiquated ways of quantifying the impact of methane on warming, that you are getting a wrong impression of how important this sector is. And a new, a new way of quantifying methane is suggested by the IPCC as well as by our scientists. So this in no way is a form of greenwashing or so. This is using an appropriate scientific quantification method that is needed for us to see progress over time. Beyond the miscalculation of certain greenhouse gas emissions, the lecture panel, along with Dr. Mitloner, describe how we can move the cattle industry from a global warming carbon contributor to a greenhouse sink. That our soils have the ability to store a lot of carbon. Okay? This is called soil carbon sequestration. And what that means is that the plants that grow in the soil during photosynthesis, pull carbon out of the air. That carbon goes through the plant into the roots and from the roots into the soil with certain microbes. These microbes trap the carbon from the air and they keep them in the soil. And that's particularly working well under grazing conditions, of which you have so much in Nebraska. The question to your university scientists is, to quantify those impacts, to quantify the ability of ranching to increase the pulling of carbon out of the air and trapping it, securing it, keeping it in the soil. Making healthy soils one of the most important toys, sorry, not toys, tools to keeping carbon locked away and not going into the air. Being one of the largest beef producing states in the U.S., Dr. Mitloner suggests Nebraska producers can play a key role in changing the perception of cattle production from a global warming contributor to a global cooling asset. It is a great state that has very uh, strong uh, livestock sectors, and it is extremely important for you to have fact-based information that leads to uh, effective public policy, effective regulations. Uh, because we all have one thing in common, and that is our goal to reduce humans' impact on climate. The livestock sector can be an important solution in this context. And in the next 10 to 20 years, we will show not just that we can re reduce impacts, but turn this industry into one that's not viewed as a challenge, but as an asset, not just producing food, but also helping us on the climate side. We would once again like to thank Dr. Frank Mitloner for taking the time to talk with us. If you didn't miss the Fall Hearman Lecture and would like to see what you missed out on, we've taken the liberty of posting a link to the video of the event on the Market Journal website. 
Moving on, and no matter what the crop, farmers and ranchers need to manage their production with purpose. Even if the crop is trees, management of those woodlands can create can be critical if the landowner is expecting an income stream from that land for timber, firewood, walnut veneer, or other markets. One practice called crop tree thinning calls for landowners to identify the trees in their particular woodlands that are not marketable or do not serve a particular purpose and to remove those trees that compete for moisture and sunlight with trees that do serve a purpose for the landowner, even if that purpose is purely recreational. You can learn more about crop tree thinning in the December issue of the Nebraska Farmer. It is now time for weather when the Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. However, since we recorded this episode early due to the university's holiday shutdown, Al will be going over the top five weather events from 2021. Well, it's that time of the year for us to do the annual update of the, what I consider the top five weather events that impacted agriculture during the year. I will say right up off the bat that the event that we've seen on December 15th with the severe weather is not included in this top five and primarily because it didn't occur during the growing season where we would see more considerable damage and we still don't have all of the storm reports in terms of property damage losses. So from that retrospect, we're gonna put that in number six position, but the number five position is a continuation of the drought across the state. We did see some alleviation of that drought during the spring period, in the late winter spring period across the panhandle with the blizzard that brought the cold weather in, and the very, very brutal cold weather into the state. And we did see Dutch in the northeastern part of the state increase its intensity in drought during the winter period, and that was a southern periphery of what the northern plains drought that continued for pretty much the entire summer. Now, as we got into the middle of the summer, we also started to see some dryness expand from central Nebraska into southeast Nebraska before the rains came during the late part of August into early September to help alleviate some of those conditions. But since this fall, we have been seeing very dry conditions across the western part of the state, so the drought will continue well in to 2022. In fourth place was a high irrigation demand that we've seen across western Nebraska. That's something we haven't had to deal with for the past few years that we've been seeing good precipitation events developed during the second half of the summer. This year it wasn't the case, and so that's taken our reservoir levels on the plat down significantly. And if we look at the upstream reservoirs, basically Seminole, Pathfinder, Glendo, and McConaughey, all under 60%. In fact, we're down into the low 20% range as we look at uh, the Seminole Reservoir. And if we look at Glendo, we're at 14%. So we're gonna need to see some significant snowfall this winter, or we're gonna have to pay particular attention to potential water restrictions as we go forward in time. Now in the third position is the summer heat. And we've seen, a rec or we've seen a temperature hit 109 degrees in Culbertson. That occurred on the 16th and the Hardington and Trenton Dan on the 17th. At least 70 or 80%, excuse me, of our stations broke 100 degrees this year. The worst of the summer heat was from the 16th to the 23rd of June. And additional information, Shattern and Valentine reached 100 degrees on 12 days, but the highest value was basically at Trenton Dam with 15 days. In second place was our January snowstorm. Six to 12 inches of snowfall hit much of South Central, Central, East Central, and Southeastern Nebraska. The maximum accumulation we've seen with this from our co-op sites was 14.8 inches at the Lincoln Airport. And the maximum from the NE Rain Network was 17.5 inches at Lincoln to Southwest, which is within, an hour, within a mile, mile and a half of where I'm located, and I recorded set, uh, 16 inches, so very comfortable with those totals. But in first place, by far, the Arctic blast that we've seen move into the state, and that, that total period was from February 6th to the 17th, with the most significant of the cold weather occurring the 14th and the 15th, as we've seen the aftermath of the blizzard in the Panhandle pull that Arctic air all the way down into Texas, the lowest temperature recorded so far that we have, minus 42 degrees at Fairbury 5 South. Every station received it, uh, that we have in the state that reported temperatures recorded at least minus 10 below zero. And when you take into consideration the spread between the highest temperature and the lowest temperature recorded in the state this year, it was 151 degree spread in a little over three months. And in addition to that, the all time difference between the highest temperature recorded in the state and the lowest temperature recorded the state, and they didn't occur in the same year, was 165 degrees. So this was a very significant event. I hope that all of you have had a good holiday season. We'll be back to see you next week with a typical weather forecast. Thanks, Al. 
Up next, one goal of any producer is to improve profit margins. Enter Range Cow Nutritionist and Extension Specialist for West Central Extension Research Center, Travis Molinex. Last spring, we caught up with Travis to discuss how the Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory Ranch of the Future is working to improve profit margins for cattle producers. Just north of Highway 2, in a sleepy sliver of the Sandhills, lies the Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory. This location is the centerpiece of what is known as the Ranch of the Future. As input costs continue to rise for many beef producers, researchers are using new technologies here to construct the most state-of-the-art management systems. With production agriculture, we've got tighter margins. Uh, increased cost of labor, increased uh, uh, feed cost, increased land cost. And there are output traits that we have, so say calf weaning weights, have not changed. And, and so our outputs are, are, are stabilized, but our inputs are keeps going up. And so that's challenging to be profitable. And, and that's where one area we see technology coming in and playing is, is how can I decrease or manage these costs better? Um, well, another one is labor finding skilled labor. And some of these technologies may not do away with labor, but they, they'll help with areas that we may be a little short in labor and help us make those decisions that used to require additional person. From monitoring health and well-being to decreasing feed input costs, there are a plethora of new technologies that are being implemented at GSL that can assist ranchers in making better management decisions faster. So th there's a lot of new air tag technologies. There's new companies coming out with uh, technologies looking at reproductive performance or indicators, uh, calving events, uh, looking at health statuses, et cetera. Uh, a lot of technology that we're looking at from a animal side is how can we use camera-based systems to get the body weight and body condition score of cows and, and utilizing such technologies as a way to monitor conditions of, of my cows and, 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 and make rapid, uh, uh, proactive decision making from that. Uh, some other technologies that we're looking at is, is some uh, smart technology feeders, so a feeding situation that I can um, deliver feed uh, to each individual cow out on the pasture. Instead of feeding a whole herd of cows a certain rate of a supplement, can I individually feed those cows and, and decrease that variation in, in response? Uh, you know, for the benefit of a producer standpoint, if I'm feeding cows on pasture, I have a high rate of variation of intake of that supplement. Even if I try to get like say two pounds per day per animal, I'm gonna have some six to eight pounds eaters and some cows are not eating anything. And so my performance result from that is, is gonna be highly variable. And so how can I really combine that with some other uh, technologies that say body weight and really be precise about my supplemental feed costs and what I'm supplementing to get an optimal performance uh, response. While the upsides to these new tools are exciting, there are still barriers to making these kind of technologies readily available to producers nationwide. You know, a lot of challenges is cost. You know, new technology comes out, there, there's high cost. Um, another is connectivity. If you think about the landscapes that we utilize in the ranching community, we're usually in larger extensive environments. Uh, uh, connectivity is one of, of being able to connect these uh, technologies to a dashboard that actually can help you make decisions. Uh, and that's been the problem with a lot of technologies is that they've been available, but they don't work in our situations because of where our cow's at. You know, in the dairy industry, they, they've utilized technologies for a long time due to the location of where their cows being able to connect wirelessly to these technologies into a platform to get those uh, that data back in a way to make decisions. Uh, and so connectivity is, is another challenge that we're faced of, of making improvements in adoption of technologies. As a centerpiece of the Ranch of the Future, the research conducted at Goodmanson Sandhills Laboratory has brought together students and faculty in closer connection with farmers and ranchers to help them make some of the best long and short term management decisions possible. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. It's always interesting to see what our colleagues in the more west side of the state are up to. Finally today, the University of Nebraska has been at the forefront of research into Nebraska's newest agricultural commodity, that being hemp. 
Earlier this year, the Nebraska Industrial Agricultural Products Center hosted a hemp seed oil press demonstration in conjunction with the Lancaster Farmers Hemp Farm Road Trip. This demonstration gave UNL researchers who work with industrial hemp the opportunity to share information regarding this new in industry, and we were fortunate enough to have a front row seat. Since industrial hemp was made legal with the 2018 Farm Bill, the specialty crop has been an intriguing prospect for many producers around the country. Furthermore, the work being done here at the University of Nebraska was intriguing enough for industrial hemp podcast producer Eric Herlock of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, to make the trek to the University of Nebraska as a highlight of his 2021 National Hemp Tour. This tour aimed to give focus to the grain and fiber aspects of the hemp crop. And uh, this summer, I went on a tour to sort of shine a light on fiber and grain producers and processors in the country. Because it seems like over the past few years, CBD has sort of taken all of the oxygen out of the conversation around industrial hemp. And that's left a lot of farmers sort of burned, um, left holding the bag, you know, not being able to sell their crops. And to me, the long-term potential of industrial hemp is in the, the industrial applications of fiber and grain, you know, food, and things we can make from it. You know, so the, the hemp plant is essentially the raw materials of all the things we could be making. You know, it sequesters carbon, uh, it's a superfood. It's just there's so many positive reasons that farmers should be growing hemp. And it's sort of my mission to help educate them and remind farmers that there's more to this than CBD and that it's not marijuana, it's, it's agriculture, it's big ag, it's, it's row crop farming. It's, you know, it's combines and, and drill presses and it's, it's agriculture and it's going to be a great um, addition to the rotation, you know, throw it in with corn and soy and we have this whole other industry, uh, an industry that's not possible without farmers. You know, we can't do this without farmers. So the, the mission of this tour is to remind farmers that, you know, we can't do this without them and there's a lot of potential here. On this particular stop of the tour, we were able to see how the University of Nebraska's Industrial Ag Products Center is utilizing hemp seed to produce products consumers like you or I could use on a daily basis by separating the oil from the seed. Yeah, so, oh, by separating the seed into its oil components and its, its protein components, it's, it's actually protein and fiber come out as what is referred to as the cake. That's what's coming out of the end of the ex expeller. And then the oil is dripping out the bottom and we've got some uh, product comes through there, but we can then filter that off. And then the clean oil would be used like a vegetable oil for our cooking oils or frying oils, salad dressings. And it's a uh, high, got a different uh, fat pro fatty acid profile. So it has some of those uh, nice desirable oils that people want that have the omega-3s A's, A's in them. So that's one way advantage of getting this oil product. And then on the protein and, and side, the, this product actually has the holes on it yet. So it's high in protein, but it's still got quite a bit of fiber in it. If we'd use a piece of equipment before this to de-hole it, then we'd have a much higher protein product coming out the end of the expeller. And that might be used for human food as well. When it comes to applications for the use of hemp seed oil and hemp stock, there are a multitude of possibilities, and the Industrial Agricultural Product Center is leaving no stone unturned. So in regards to research in the hemp, we're primarily working in the area of the separation technology, one kind of providing a service that if entrepreneurs or industry would like to have oil separated from the seed, we can provide that service through our service center. And then from the research standpoint, and there's interest in the fiber as well, of whether we can use the hemp plant fiber, so more from the stalk of the uh, plant, and whether we could use that for fiber. And then there's research going on from that lignocellulosic portion of it. Can we use that as a feed stock? The industry is pretty well developed already. If we can get a animal feed protein, you know, that'll kind of just drop in as a, a alternative to soybean meal. But the fiber side is still, still where the use of the lignin or the a cellulose portions of the fiber from the plant could be used. That's when we might talk about biofuels from cellulosic biofuels that would come from the hemp plant that you could use the stalk for that application and the seed would still go to a, a more traditional application. While the hemp industry is up and running in the United States, 
Eric points out that there's still a significant amount of red tape to cut when it comes to making hemp a mainstay crop for many producers around the country. Um, it's like this crop could be an excellent feed for livestock, um, poultry, hogs, cattle, anything could be, could be eating this, but it's still illegal. You can feed hemp seeds to your children, but not to your, your cattle. So like that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but there are people out there working on that. Um, but yeah, we need to change the federal regulations. Um, I think we also need to raise the THC limit right now. The legal definition of industrial hemp is 0.3%. Um, and that's just a little too low because some of these varieties will, will spike under certain conditions. And when I say spike, they'll get a little bit more THC, like over that legal limit, but nothing near what is in actual marijuana. Um, so just to give a little extra room there would be, would be good for farmers. As the Industrial Hemp Podcast continues to discuss the possibilities for utilization of the hemp plant, the University of Nebraska's Industrial Agricultural Product Center is leading the charge into the benefits this crop could hold for the ag industry and consumers alike. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. If you'd like more information on the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Industrial Agricultural Product Center or that hemp podcast from Lancaster Farming, we've included some helpful links on the Market Journal website. That is going to wrap up this year's holiday episode. If you happen to miss a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app, or you can always follow us on YouTube and social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll be back to our regular format with all new reports. On behalf of myself and the entire Market Journal team, we hope you and yours are having a safe and enjoyable holiday season. Hope to see you right back here next time. Until then, I'm Bryce Duskett. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.